If you go to modern day Turkey, in modern day Turkey, these seven churches, um, the places of these seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, um, you can visit these places. These places are not far from each other, probably 40, 50 miles from each other. Um, but you'll not find churches. You know why? I want you to listen carefully, please. God is interested in people. God is not interested in building or material or any structure. Jesus is interested in you. Jesus is interested in me. Shall we say amen? Because there are no praying people. There are no people who are going to give out, you know, are passionate about the gospel. You know, we who hold the Bible and who say that we are born again, you have the greatest news, the greatest news that is ever given to mankind, that God became man. He loved us so much that he died your death and my death. And whoever believes on Jesus Christ and his death, burial and resurrection will experience the resurrection power and will live forever. You know, nobody else have this kind of a message. Only those who know Christ Jesus has that message. But we need to be, we need to be able to take that message to share with others. My heart grieves to go to some places to see that there are no churches. The reason is, not because there are no people. Not because people do not have money. Not because there are, there are no buildings. Buildings, money are not the problem. Not even the people are the, you know, not, the, not that there are no people. But there are no people who have a heart for what God wants. There are no people who want to do the will of God. No people who want to live for the sake of the Lord. You know, life is temporary, my dear brothers and sisters. Your life that you submit to live for him is only that will last. Everything else that we'll do for our sakes will be gone. So we'll come back to book of Revelation chapter 2. We will listen to this message. You know, we've been, uh, last two Sundays, we've been meditating on overcoming life. Which Jesus or Lord Jesus would appear and speak. If Jesus were to appear, Lord Jesus were to appear in our midst and speak, you know, what would he speak about? He would speak about overcoming life. Why is the Lord talks most about, you know, the, that we need to live a life without sin, overcoming sin, not only overcoming, overcoming every temptation and attraction of the world, that we may live a life. You know, only overcomers are true Christians. I want you to remember this, please. Do you want to say amen? amen. Only overcomers. You might say, how can you say that? 1 John chapter 5. I want you to look at the scripture, please. Um, the the so-called worldly Christians... The person who loves, who say, I love the Lord, but I also love the world. You know, let me have one leg here, one leg there. You know, let me do whatever I want kind of a lifestyle. And still say that they are Christian. You know, there are many um, are deceiving, deceived and they deceive themselves. 1 John chapter 5. And I want you, I'll read the four verses. Please listen carefully. 1 John chapter 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, or if you don't have a Bible, just look at and then follow me. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. You know, a lot of people think, you know, doing what Jesus says is very hard, burdensome. But the Lord says, you know, John says that it is not burdensome. Verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory which overcomes the world, their faith. You live by faith and you'll overcome the world. If you're born again, if you're a true child of God, overcoming life should be your everyday life. What do you mean by overcoming life? We'll get into that. You know, last two Sundays we have um, um, meditated on that. Uh, last Sunday we've, we've been through the message that the Lord gave to the church at Smyrna. Come back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Everyone who is born of God will overcome the world. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, 
you live an overcoming life. May the Lord help all of us to live an overcoming life. Amen? Um, that's what we need to learn. Revelation chapter 2 now, and then verse 12. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, the words of him who has two-edged sword. Why is, what does the Lord Jesus um, reveal himself to? Um, different people in different ways. Different people in different ways. Here we see there are seven churches in the book of Revelation. To each church, the message of Lord Jesus is different. You know, to what Ephesus the Lord said, you know, to, to the church of Ephesus, the Lord said is like this, I'm the one who walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. I have the seven stars in my hand. If you, you know, you've fallen from the first love, if you don't repent and, you know, do the works that you're doing at first, I will come and remove that lampstand. That is the word uh, to Ephesus. But if you go to Ephesus now, you will not find a church. You know, to Smyrna, to Smyrna, these are the people who are being persecuted for the sake of faith. People who are being um, beaten, put in jail. To them, the Lord says, don't fear. Don't fear about the trouble that were about to come to you. Don't fear about the trouble that is among you. He says, I died and rose again. I can help you. Death is not the final answer. You have to think about the second death. You know, I've shared this last, last week. If you pay attention, please. The word of God says like this. Uh, that those who overcome second death will have no control over them. Listen carefully, please. If a person is born once, he will die twice. If a person is born twice, he will die only once. You mean, what is the meaning of that statement? We are physically born into this world. That is the first birth. But the second birth is when the Spirit of God comes upon a person. You'll have the spiritual birth. That is born again. Your Spirit of God comes upon. You're a new person. Life comes into you. That person is born twice. But that person will only die once. Meaning physical death, but the second death, you know, there is a Bible that is called it a second death. Second death is when a lake of fire which will burn forever and ever and ever, and, the, and that person will not enter the lake of fire. Shall we say amen? Because Jesus died and rose again, those who believe in Lord Jesus are filled with the Spirit of God. They're truly, genuinely born again. They're not going to go to the lake of fire. They will live with the Lord forever and ever. That is the gospel. We need to hold on to it. But here when the Lord is speaking to these people who are being persecuted, the Lord says, don't fear. I died and rose again. I'll keep you from that second death. Listen carefully, please. Last week I was uh, called to preach at a conference uh, um, that, was, uh, that was happening for um, the Southern Baptist Conference. Has a, um, had a conference and was asked to share. Before me, um, I was asked to share about um, reaching the, share the gospel with a, with a Hindu friend. Before me, a Jewish rabbi preached. First, a Jewish rabbi preached. He grew up as a, um, a rabbi sharing, you know, uh, learning about the, the Torah and teaching God's word. That man was going through a lot of temptation with sin. He struggled with some temptation and there was no help for him. The temptation became so severe that he stopped being a rabbi. He no longer is teaching in the, in the synagogue. And then he lost membership of the synagogue. And no more going to fellowship with the synagogue. A Christian friend befriended him. Introduced him to Jesus. He said, all the Old Testament that you read about talks about the Messiah. And the Messiah is Jesus Christ come to him. As soon as he surrendered his life to Christ, you know what happened? He's been delivered from all these temptations. He says, I have a new life and I've experienced. I know how a life would be in sin, bondage. I don't want to do things, but I'll be dragged into. I'll tell you, sin is like a bondage. Sin is like a person held by chains will be dragged by sin. He says, my life is transformed. I was so joyful to listen to a Jewish testimony. And he became a Christian preacher. Now he's a, um, he's a servant of God, serving. And I heard him next is... Uh, um, a Muslim brother share. He was a Muslim, but he came to Christ. He said, 
I've been, you know, I, somebody sent me um, a part of the Bible, a gospel. I started reading it, and I started reading it to prove that it is wrong. And Jesus started speaking to me. We never believed that, we only believed Jesus was a prophet. We never believed that he is the son of God and died and rose again. He was going through terrible sickness. After he prayed, he sees a dream of Lord Jesus with, you know, nail-pierced hands, holes in the hands and feet. He placed his nail-pierced hand on the person, and that man is healed miraculously. That same night, he receives Lord Jesus as his savior. That man shared a testimony. I was so joyful to hear these testimonies of people coming to Christ. He says, death can do nothing to me. I know, because... My, my Jesus died and rose again. I have seen Lord Jesus and there is no fear in my life, he says. I was so joyful to listen. Lord willing, we'll have him to come and share a testimony one day. He lives close by. Um, so I'll ask him to come and share his testimony. Uh, but what a powerful testimony of a person. His own family threw him out. His own family threw him out, but he's standing for the Lord, serving God. You know, here, to each one, the reason why I want to tell, say this is this. Whatever you are going through, the Lord will reveal himself to you according to your need. Do you want to say amen? Whatever is your need. For a person going through sickness, they seek the Lord. Lord, I need healing. The Lord will come as a healer and reveal himself to them. A person who is a seeker asking questions. The Spirit of God will reveal and speak and say, I'm going to answer you the questions. There are some people who are seeking like that. Whatever is the problem, the Lord will reveal to each one according to their need. Here he this says, this, this church have gone astray from the right path. But there are some, as I've said um, last Sunday too, look at book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 13. I know where you dwell. I know where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my, my faithful martyr. There it says, um, witness, but the, but the Greek word there is martyrs, which means martyr, um, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. I want you to listen carefully, please. Last Sunday I shared about, unless you are faithful till the end, you are not truly saved. When persecution comes, a lot of people want to leave. And we've read those verses, which says like this, um, he that endures till the end will be saved. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 24. I want you to turn there, please. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Matthew 24, verse 13. This is the word of God. Um, time and again, the Lord repeats that phrase. Matthew 24, 13. The word of God says, He who endures to the end will be saved. He says, You remain faithful to me in the midst of trials. A lot of people leave Jesus when times become hard. And there are troubles in their lives. If you leave Lord Jesus and say, I don't believe in Jesus any longer. He's no longer helping me because you get some problem. The Lord says, you're not saved. And you know, there's, I, we read last, one more verse. I want to repeat that verse for everybody's sake. Because Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is the Lord sending his own disciples. You know, all the 12 apostles to ministry. While he's sending them for ministry, he says like this, Gospel according to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. So be wise as serpents and be innocent as doves. Meaning, I'm sending you among wolves and you are sheep. Sheep can never fight with a wolf. Wolves are the ones who will kill and eat sheep. He says, be wise. Be understanding, quickly understand. And he uses two pictures. One is the, the wiseness of a serpent is it can quickly move. And says harmlessness of doves is it is innocent. It, is, it does no harm to anybody. He says when we live in a society, as Christians we should harm no one. Do you want to say amen? A lot of people say you do damage to me, I will do damage to you. He is not a true Christian. You know Christians are being persecuted everywhere in the world. You know, when people wanted to stone Lord Jesus, you know what Lord Jesus did? Can anybody tell me what Lord Jesus did? He went away one time. He hid himself one time. He is the king of kings. If he could fight with people, nobody can stand in front of him. But he never fought with people. He hid himself. He went away. 
He was persecuted, but he stood faithful. He taught the same thing to his disciples. Do not fight back for, with others who are fighting with you. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. And the Lord says like this, verse 21 and 22. Brothers will deliver over to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against his parents to have them put to death. But you have, and you will be hated for my name's sake. By the one, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. If you, if you accept Lord Jesus, if you live for the Lord, you, the Lord is not promising that you'll have an easy and a rosy life on this earth. You'll have troubles, but you have eternity secure. You live for him forever and ever. Amen? A lot of people want security here, not knowing where they'll end up. I want to be safe somehow. But he's saying to his disciples, you'll have trouble. You know, people will hand you over to death. People will do all kinds of things with you. But stay faithful till the end. If you believe in Lord Jesus, because he died and rose again to give you life. If you remain faithful till the end, you are a true believer. You'll stay with him forever and ever. He that endures till the end will be saved. There are a lot of time many will fall away but come back to Revelation chapter 2. He says, this church has some people who are struggling, who are staying and keeping their faith in the midst of every trial. I want to encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, whatever you're going through, whatever your pain is, whatever your suffering is, maybe a pain at workplace, pain in the family, pain with a, with a, with a health problem, or whatever problem you have, stay faithful till the end. You'll have a crown. Amen? Don't, you know, a lot of times when trouble comes, first reaction would be we want the trouble to end quickly. The second reaction is, this is going on for too long, let me run away. Let me give you an example. If you have a health problem, if you go on a vacation, will the health problem go away? Don't take vacations from your problems. Because if you have a health problem, even if you go on a vacation, it will come with you. If you have a work problem, if you go on a vacation, it's not going to be solved. Yes or no? Even if you go on a vacation from a family trouble, it's not going to go away. Be faithful till the end. And you will um, be saved and you'll receive a crown. This church, there are some people who stayed faithful to God in the midst of trials. You think about Christians now. Um, this is not a made-up story. This is published in the uh, Billy Graham's uh, um, evangelistic newsletter. One, um, one lady came to Christ in Egypt um, because she came to Christ and her, her, her husband doesn't like it. He's a bank manager, he's a good position, he's a well, you know, well-educated man, but he doesn't like his wife to be a Christian. Um, she started reading Bible and he's getting a um, little irritated. Every night he comes home drunk and beats her up. And then she's very irritated by that. He's irritated. One day he wanted to kill her. He wanted to kill her and, and this is not a made up story. So this bank manager has one key, master key of the bank at home. So he wanted an excuse to kill his wife. You know what he did? He wanted to put an excuse that he lost the key and killed his wife. So while going to work, he crossed the river Nile, he took the key and dropped it in river Nile went to work, worked all day, and after the work is done, he drank again as usual. Um, he drank and he's coming back home. When he came back home, um, this lady, as soon as he went away to work, she started praying. She started praying and she God put in her heart to cook a nice meal for her husband for that, and then um, she, she did, like, quickly did that. So that man, you know, came, went to work, drank and came back and he started beating his wife as soon as he came home. As soon as he beat his wife and then he says, he started asking her for the key. Hey, I kept the key here, where is the key? Now because the key is not there, actually he would grab, ran and grabbed a big knife to come and kill her. When he, when he ran away to get the knife and come back, she said, here is your key. That man fully drunk, in one second, his nasha utar gaya, ek minute. One minute, his intoxication is gone, his intoxication. 
how did you get the key? He asked. He just looked at the key, looked at it and says, tell me how did you get this key? He, he was so curious, tell me how did you get this key? And she asked, why? Why did you ask? He said, you left it here, right? He said, no. I wanted to kill you, that's why I got this knife. I dropped it this morning in River Nile, he himself told his wife. He said, I was praying this morning. The Lord gave me um, uh, a message that I should cook a nice meal for you. I went to the market, I bought a fish, and I cleaned it, cut it up, and I see the key in it. Here is the fish, here is the curry, and this is the key. <laughs> that man fell on his knees and says, your God whom you believe is a real God. You want to say amen? Yeah. He did not kill his wife, and he became a Christian. He came to Christ. The Lord knows our trials and everything that you go through. You stay faithful to him, even though it may cost you your life. He's not going to say it is easy life. Life is short. A man will live, man's life is 70 years, but even by greater strength, it is 80 years. That's it. But you're going to live forever, ever. We are not made to live for just 70 years, 80 years, and be done and be gone. A lot of people say, oh, after death, for atheists, there is no life after death. For, for, for others, there maybe they think about reincarnation. But for those who believe in the scriptures, yes, a man which is appointed for man to die once and appear before God. We live in eternity forever either with God or away from God in, the lake of, in that Hades or lake of fire. But if you are a true believer, you live with him forever and ever. Stay faithful to him till the end because only those who stay faithful till the end will be saved and they will receive the crown. You need to be overcomers. A lot of people are, are fearful. May the Lord take away the spirit of fear from you. Amen? Amen? You know, you're fearful of your life, fearful of what will happen, fearful of jobs, health, everything. But those who, Jesus, the reason why he said, I died and rose again to Smyrna Church, is to tell them, hey, don't worry about death. Because I'll tell you what will happen after death, because I don't die and rose again. I've been there and done that. I've come back. And I'll tell you what will happen. Come back to Revelation chapter 2. Here is what the word of God says. But I have few things against you. That you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. You see when the Lord appears some midst of people. So if the Lord were to appear here, he knows every heart. You know, even before our thought comes to our mind, he knows it. He knows where our heart is. You know, where our lifestyle is. Where our life is in regards to him, in relationship to others. In this church of Pergamum, there are some who believe what is called a doctrine of Balaam. What is doctrine of Balaam? Doctrine means teaching. Um, that, is the, that is the original meaning of the word uh, uh, from the Greek. Uh, doctrine means teaching. There are some who have teaching of Balaam. You know what is teaching of Balaam? Listen carefully, please. There's much of teaching of Balaam nowadays all over the world in Christian churches. You know what is doctrine of Balaam? You can take your sin lightly. That is teaching of Balaam. If you want to be an overcomer, you have to overcome sin in your own life. What the scripture says. Okay, what does what does Balaam say? Look at the verse, verse 14, please. Um, let me read that. Who taught Balak or Balak to put stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice. I don't have time to read all what Balaam has done. I'll tell you briefly, listen carefully, please. When you go home, read these three chapters. Numbers chapter 22, Numbers chapter 23, Numbers chapter 24, three chapters. Uh, in these three chapters, there, there was a prophet in the Old Testament called Balaam. Some call it Balaam and some call it Balaam. Um, Americans have a different pronunciation. Indians have a different pronunciation. Whatever you call it, you call it aluminum or aluminum. It's the same thing. It's the material is the same thing. Um, so Balaam, who's this Balaam guy? Balaam is a prophet. He's a prophet of God. He knows, he has a revelation of who God is, but his life is not right. 
So is the life of many who say they are Christians. Who have, they have the revelation of the God's word. But their life is not right. You know what this Balaam is? Um, there's a king of uh, Moabites called uh, Balak. He comes and says, hey, there are a people of Israel going out. These people of Israelites are coming from Egypt and they are going to Canaan. And they are asking me if they can pass by my land. I said no to them. They are a big people. I want you to come and curse them. He says, I want this prophet to curse them. You know what Balaam says? Wait, wait, wait. I cannot come unless God gives me permission. Let me pray. So Balaam started praying. Balaam started praying and the Lord says, no, no, don't go with them. How can you bless the people whom I have blessed? How can you curse the people whom I have blessed? I have blessed these people. Don't curse them. You are not going with them. So Balaam comes and says to this people, of, uh, to this King Balak, I cannot come because these people are blessed by God. I cannot curse them. So Balak gets, okay, how can I entice him to come? So again, Balak sends people so they'll give him more gifts to the prophet. So he would come and curse them. So this Balaam, you know, looked at the gift and then he is changed. My dear brothers and sisters, Balaam's life is this. He has a revelation of God, but his character will change depending on the situation with when there is money involved. A person who has greed of money cannot be useful to God. You know, a lot of people fall because they have love of money inside. Out of outward, they, they may know the scripture, they have, you know, pious life. But, you know, you have, they have external uh, righteousness. But their internal, they have greed for money. You know, Balaam said, okay, I'll come with you. Lord said, when Balaam is going, Balaam, Balaam is riding uh, an animal. What is that animal? Anybody tell me. Wow, some of you are awake. awake. Um, he is riding a donkey. He's not riding. And then the donkey stops there. And he doesn't move. You know who's standing before and Balaam cannot see now? There's the angel of the Lord drawn with a sword standing right in front like this. Prophet doesn't see, the donkey sees. Sometimes he'll allow donkeys to see and the prophets don't see. When they are disobedient to the word of God. Any prophet who is disobedient to God's word is useless to God. Even Jonah. God wanted him. He's got the message of God. But before he preaches, he says, I don't want to preach. He brought trouble for others. He brought trouble for himself. Balaam is going away from God. Even though you, you might know the revelation of God's word. But if you are going against his word. He could not see the angel with a sword drawn out. The donkey, he beats the donkey. And the Lord opens the mouth of the donkey. You know, a um, lot of time God will open, you know, little kids. People who don't know anything or like those like a donkey is to teach those who think that they're already Christian, they were walking with God. A donkey spoke and said, why are you beating me? I saved your life. Otherwise the angel would have killed you. He goes and takes him and hits him to the wall. That's when Balaam realizes. Balaam's life is saved. He goes there. Instead of cursing the people of Israel, he starts to bless them. Balak is tired. He says, I sent you gifts. You know, you said you can't come first time. I sent you more gifts. You came, but instead of uh, cursing, now you're blessing them. He even talks about Jesus in number chapter 24, verse 17. He says, I, star, I see a star come out of Jacob, he says. Balaam prophesied about Lord Jesus hundreds of years. He prophesied about the birth of Lord Jesus, that he'll be a star. But his life itself was not right with God. So Balak is tired and says, now I want to ask one thing. You, you did not curse the people of Israel, but tell me how can I defeat these people? You know what Balaam said? Listen carefully, please. Balaam said one thing. I cannot curse the people whom God has blessed, but you can bring a disaster on them if you make them sin. So what he said is this. Make these people eat whatever is sacrificed to the idols. They don't keep themselves holy. 
and then not only uh, practice, you know, sacrifice to idols, but also let them become their about own their own relationship with a man and his wife. They will not have just you know, one wife. In the Old Testament, it was for a Jewish person to only marry a Jewish person. That was their Old Testament tradition. He says, the Lord says, let them practice sexual immorality. Let them become perverse in their sexual things. God will curse them. So what, you know what Balak did? I want to read one verse. Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. Book of Numbers from the Old Testament. Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 31, verse 16. The word of God says like this, uh, verse 15, And Moses said to them, Have you let all the women live? Behold, these on the Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. So a plague came among the congregation of the Lord. You know, God sent a plague on his own people because they sinned against him. Listen carefully, please. Israelites... No external person could do anything because they have God done, they have blessed. My dear brothers and sisters, nobody can do anything to you because you are covered under the blood of Lord Jesus. Do you want to say amen? amen? Satan can do nothing to you. You know, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. You know that song, right? The last verse of that song, um, if you remember, you know, no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. I'll tell you, no power of hell can do anything to you. No man can do anything to you. Satan cannot do anything to you. People cannot do anything to you. Because you belong to your the hand of Christ. But you can bring harm upon yourself. If you're in the hand of God, nobody can snatch you from the Lord's hands. That is the promise of John 10, 28. But you yourself can leave the hand and let the hand not protect you when you sin against the Lord. If you don't learn that scripture, you will destroy, bring destruction upon yourself. Nobody will be external. Nobody can do anything to you. You know, before a person falls into great sin, you know where he falls first? In his heart. Before a person commits adultery, leave his wife and goes with another woman, he has a problem inside the heart. You need to guard your inner life first. Unless you have inner purity, automatically something will happen one day. Five years down, ten years down, definitely that person will commit adultery. If a person is, uh, you know, attracted to pornography, you know, that person one day will definitely, his life, his married life will be a mess and he'll leave his wife one day for sure. Family will break. Because they can control the lust. They have, not, they have not experienced the deliverance of Jesus. If a person is alcoholic, they'll bring upon destruction upon themselves. If a person says, okay, let me just play with sin for some time, nobody's watching. They are bringing destruction. Nobody else can do harm to you but your own life. If you belong to Christ, Satan cannot touch you. People can do no harm to you. Your boss can do no harm to you. Your neighbor can do no harm to you. No person can. Because your life is secure. Satan says, I cannot touch. Do you know how the discussion between God and Satan regarding Job? Satan says, I can't touch him. You put a fence around his house. Around him. Around everything he's got. But you can bring a destruction upon yourself. Your own inner life, if it is not pure. In the Bible studies, we've been discussing about inner life for the last two, three weeks. Um, so your inner life, your inner life, your, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the righteousness of Pharisees and scribes, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Meaning, inside. Do you believe the doctrine of Balaam? The doctrine of Balaam is this. Oh, nobody's perfect. And the flesh will keep on sinning. I'll tell you, nobody's perfect. But the Lord says, you should strive for perfection. You know, if somebody speaks on perfection from the Bible, they will be branded as perfectionists and says, okay, they're talking impractical stuff. That may be impractical from the worldly perspective, but this is scripture which says like this, be perfect as heavenly pa- your heavenly father is perfect. We have to be strive for perfection. Do you want to say amen? Only if you're striving, that means you're living to live a life that is pleasing God. If you don't strive for perfection, you are compromised with sin. 
again, for those who are really um, saying, oh, my, my past sin, my present sin, my future sin is covered for, let me live however I want. I want you to read, please, Hebrews chapter 10, because this is what the Word of God says. Yes, Jesus died for the sin of the world. He died for your sin and my sin. But that sin which is confessed, that sin which is washed, Hebrews chapter 10, the Word of God says like this, verse um, 26, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, for if we go on sinning deliberately, this is written to uh, Christians who are from Jewish background, that's why it is called Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, if you go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has not set aside by the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who spurns the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he is sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? You have defiled the blood of Jesus. You have outraged, meaning grieved, quenched the spirit of God. A person who willfully sins. Coming back to the doctrine of Balaam in Revelation chapter 2. If you say, let me live my life. You know, the quickest way people will allow trouble for themselves in their physical body is this. Sexual sin is the quickest way for a person will die or a person would bring trouble on himself. Um, Proverbs, you know, I don't have time to read. Proverbs 5 and 6. When you go home and read and see Proverbs 5 and 6. You know why I'm telling you Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs chapter 6 is this. If any one person goes to um, a prostitute or an adulteress or any kind, this kind of relationship, he says, every sin is out of the body, but this sexual immorality is with the body. He says, Anyone who goes into having a relationship like that is taking the staircase into a sheol or to death. A lot of people enjoy these sexual uh, perverse things on TV, internet, relationships, all kinds of stuff. I'll tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, your body will be first to be affected. I'm not making this up. The scripture says, can you play with fire and not hurt yourself? Can you take fire in your bosom and not hurt yourself? That's what Proverbs 5 and Proverbs chapter 6 says. If you just play with fire, definitely you'll be burnt. In the same way, a body will be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 5 is one more example. Uh, turn with me, 1 Corinthians 5. The word of God says like this. First Corinthians 5. It is verse 1, it is actually reported that sexual immorality among you, a kind not tolerate among pagans. A man has his father's wife, meaning he has a relationship with his stepmother. Though you are arrogant, ought not to have rem rather be mourn, let him who has done this be removed from among you. If somebody calls himself a Christian and who is living in an adulterous lifestyle, he's saying to telling the church, hey, talk to that guy. If he repents, it's good. If he doesn't repent, throw him out of the church. Verse 3 says, For though I am absent in the body, I am present in spirit, and if I am present, I already pronounce judgment. The verse 5 says, You ought to deliver that man to Satan for destruction of the flesh. You see there? So that his spirit would be saved at the last day. The scripture says, Deliver him up to Satan. He will die. That's what he's saying. Satan will destroy his body. If anyone plays with sexual sin, they are inviting trouble for themselves. With your sight, with your mind, with your body, keep your body holy. Do you want to say amen? We should be overcomers. Overcomers of sexual sin. Oh, you might say, how is that possible for a human? I'll tell you if you come to Jesus, you say, Lord, I struggle with this sin. I want to overcome this sin. The Lord will give you deliverance. Amen? If the Lord sets you free, you'll be free indeed. But there are a lot of people who will say, no, 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 you'll struggle with sin till the end of your life. If you come to him, he will set you free. You will be freed from that particular sin. And you can live an overcoming life. May the Lord help you to overcoming in your thought life. Because this is where 
This is the battlefield. Mind is a battlefield for a person. If you overcome in your thoughts, your life will be pure. Your eyes will be pure. Your heart will be pure. Your life will be pure. No sickness, no death will come to you. Um, that's what the scripture says. So live an overcoming life there. Um, and then uh, food sacrifice to idols. Be, be really careful about um, what you do with the so-called other things. A lot of people are interested in uh, demon, demon activity. A lot of people want to say, hey, I want to see how you know, satanic worship would be. Please do not get involved in that. That is all evil. What does you have to do anything with that? So um, be careful about your own life. When you overcome sin, the Lord will help you. And even to idols, there are many scriptures in the Old Testament which says, you know, idols are not really gods. But if there's a food offered to idol and offered to you, first pray and eat. But, you know, if, it's, if you know that it's offered to idol, please don't eat. But even if you, somebody gives you that and you don't know it, first pray and through prayer it is sanctified. I want to read one verse for those who have a lot of questions in that area. First Timothy chapter 4. Um, and I say, okay, if somebody gives me something, I don't know where it came from. Um, should I eat kosher food, non-kosher food, halal food, non-halal food, you know, this food or that food, you know, what should I do? You know, if anybody brings you food which you don't know, okay, the Bible says like this. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4 and 5. For everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected, but it is to have to be received with thanksgiving. Verse 5 important. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Do you want to say amen? When you pray for the food, anything that's, that's been given to you, always pray through your prayer that food is sanctified and your body is kept holy for the Lord. You see, we need to know that our, we have a holy God. You know, what do you mean by holy God? Holy God is, yes, he is without sin, but he is unique and there is none like him. And he wants to have a people, you know, Christians are believers or those who are not compromised with the world. If our life has no difference from the world, sad to say they are worldly, they are not born again. The true born again believers will overcome the world. The worldly attractions, the worldly stuff, if the lot of Christians will have just like, life just like the world. <coughs> we are nobody to judge the people. God will judge them for sure. But we have to make sure my life, I have to make sure my life, my spouse, my children walk in the ways of God. You should say, as for me, I will not do this. Others may do it. Do you want to say amen? As for me, I want to keep my life holy because he that is born of God will overcome the world. That is what overcoming life. I'll close with this. Revelation chapter 2. Come back, please. If somebody does not um, respond to the warning of the Lord, that he is giving to the church of Pergamum. He says like this, Therefore repent, if not I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Um, the, the word of God is compared to, it is sharper, it is compared to a two-edged sword. Don't say it's a two-edged sword. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 also says the same thing. Um, shall we turn there please? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Um, the word of God says, this is the very good verse to memorize if you can memorize this. The word, of, the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It's compared to a two-edged sword. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. What does it do? It pierces the soul. Pierces to divide the soul and the spirit. The joint and the marrow. And the word of God discerns the thoughts of humans. The intentions of the heart. You know, the word of God can discern what is happening in our life. The word of God is living and active. It will separate what is spiritual and what is soulish. That's what the word of God does. But the word of God, listen carefully please. The word of God can heal. A knife, a knife can be used for healing. The knife can be also used for killing. Right? A surgeon will use a knife. A knife skillfully take out tumors, take out... You know, infections, parts which are not necessary in the body. That knife is actually saving that person's life. Cutting off something from the body will save that person's life. If the Lord does a surgery, he will save you. But the same sword, 
The word of God. The word of God can bring healing to some. But the same word of God will bring death to some. What? How can word of God will bring death to some? He is not talking to unbelievers outside somewhere. He is believing, he's speaking to the church of Pergamum. He says, there are some who hold on to the doctrine of Balaam. If you don't turn, Jesus, see, the Lord is not judgmental for outsiders and then, you know, insiders, you know, he will just let them give them a free reign. It's, he's not like that. He says, if you play with sin, you know, true mark of the child of God is this, you have, you have overcome sin, you have forgiven of your sin, you have overcome sin, and you live an overcoming life. That is a mark of a true believer. If you are born again, you live an overcoming life. Overcoming life is not an optional for some saints. Oh, it is for Sadhu Sundar Singh, it's for Brother Bhakti Singh, or it's for, you know, so, so and so, Brother Aishana, for the DGS Dinakaran, or for the so and so. This life is only for like saints like Moody or Billy Graham. We think like that. But everyone who is born of God will overcome the world. Do you want to say amen? I want to live that overcoming life. Lord, help me. Is it possible? A lot of people will tell you it is not possible. But the Bible says, and Jesus said, you need to live an overcoming life. Jesus overcame the world. We need to overcome the world. Um, the same to it, sword. In the second coming, there's going to some uh, happen like this. Um, two verses that we've done. Revelation chapter um, 19. Revelation chapter 19. In the second coming, there is going to be a war. In that war, the Lord is not going to use a nuclear bomb or an atom bomb. Or a hydrogen bomb. In that war. Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 and 21. And the beast who was captured with its false prophet. Who was in his presence have done this. Signs by which he deceived those who dis, uh, received the mark of the beast. And those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown into the lake of fire. That burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword. That came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. You see. Those who followed the, the false prophet and the beast, the antichrist and the false prophet, in the second coming of the Lord, there will be a battle of Armageddon. In a valley of Megiddo, he will gather himself. If you go to the land of Israel, um, in, the, in the, the plain of the valley of Megiddo, you'll see closer to Nazareth, up on the Galilee side, is a huge, that is called a mother of all battlefields. 200 million people can fit there. They'll gather themselves to fight against the Lord. The Lord will just speak a word. And a lot of people said, you know, if you drop an atom bomb or, um, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki is still recovering out of that. A uh, nuclear bomb is the most powerful and the people are scared of a nuclear, we are on the brink of a nuclear war. Watch out, somebody said. A nuclear bomb can wipe away one part of the uh, uh, United States easily, somebody said. But the Lord, when he comes back, he, his word is more powerful than anything else. With his word, he created. It's a creative power. At the same time, he makes war with his word. So the enemies of God will be judged with the word of God. The Lord will speak a word and they will perish. Such is a strong thing. And he spoke those words to the church. Revelation chapter 2. And But if you live an overcoming life, I want to end this with a promise. This is the promise that Lord Jesus gives. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. He who has, has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit said, says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give him hidden manna. You know, he'll give you food that the world doesn't know about. You know, what is manna? Manna is a food that came from heaven. When people saw the manna, they said, what is it? In Hebrew, what is it means manna. Now, what is it? Now, this is, he'll give you hidden food, secret food that others don't have any clue about. I'm not talking about physical food. You have a revelation of God's presence. People are not really seeking that revelation. When we, the entire book of Revelation is really having, seeing the things of glory. You know, what we Christians should seek for is this. Lord, you said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to know your glories. That's what, you know, Psalmist David said. I want to um, dwell in the house of God and I want to behold his beauty. His beauty should shine upon us, right? Amen? His face should shine upon us. Amen? That's what we should long for if you overcome 
His beauty will shine upon you. You know, His revelation will be given. He will give you a white stone and a new name written on a stone that no one knows except Him who receives it. You'll receive a new name. You know, with a new name, always associated. God changed names. Names in the Bible. I wanted to think about that. Each name change comes with God having a greater purpose for that person. He changed Abram to Abraham. He says, Father of exalted from Father of exalted Father to Father of many nations. From Sarai to Sarah. He changed from Jacob, a deceiver, a supplanter, to Israel, meaning the one who will overcome. The one who wrestled with God and man and he's prevailed. You know, God wants to change you from Jacob to a, an Israel. Do you want to say amen? Meaning instead of going to deceive to get something, you wrestle with God and you receive the blessing of God. You see that? The, we need to have that kind of an experience. The new name, he changed from Simon to Peter. Peter means rock. He will make your life unchangeable, unshakable. When your life will become a rock, God can use and build his kingdom on that rock. Do you want to say amen? That is what we should long for. We should long for. Shall we bow our heads? Are you playing with sexual sin?